Welcome everyone to this webinar brought to you by the Israel Defense and Security Forum, IDSF. Apologies on our late start. We ran into some tech issues, but now we are up and running. Um, IDSF, of course, in Hebrew, our name is Abitronistim. IDSF is the leading Israeli organization advocating for strong strategic national security oriented policies. Our movement consists of more than 20,000 people here in Israel, including many reserve officers and operators from all branches of the Israel Defense Establishment who believe that strong national security and staunch Zionism are necessary for Israel to be the eternal homeland of the Jewish people. Thank you so much to all of our viewers and all of our supporters for tuning into these war briefings. It's so important that we're able to share these updates with you um, and this analysis on a regular basis. We're going to jump right into it. I'm very pleased to be joined by Asher Fredman, who is the uh, director for Israel of the Abraham Accords Peace Institute, as well as the director for the Miskav Institute. Did I get that right, Asher? Absolutely. Amazing. Thank you so much for joining me today. We have a lot to talk about. People are thinking about Qatar. People are thinking about what's going on in Gaza. But we got to start with the Abraham Accords. Um, if there's one person to speak to about Abraham Accords, it is definitely you. Uh, so what I really like to begin with is really just understanding, have the Abraham Accords helped with this war in Gaza in any real way? So Moshe, thank you so much um, for having me and thank you to the Bishonisim and it's a pleasure to, to join you um, this evening or this morning. And just to give a little bit of context, the Abraham Accords Peace Institute is an American um, nonprofit focused on strengthening ties between the Abraham Accords countries. And the Miskav Institute for National Security and Zionist Strategy is a relatively new Israeli policy center led by Mayor Ben Shabbat, who was Israel's national security advisor until 2021 and really the key Israeli figure in developing the Abraham Accords. And there's been a question, what is, how is the Gaza war going to impact the Abraham Accords? Are the, how are the Abraham Accords going to impact the Gaza war? In terms of the Abraham Accords ties themselves, on the diplomatic level, we've seen them uh, stay steady. We saw Israeli President Herzog and Emirati President Mohammed bin Zayed meet in Dubai on November 30th on the sidelines of the UN Climate Conference. The Crown Prince of Bahrain, opened up the Manama Dialogue, a security, very important security forum on November 17th. And he stated very, he said, um, I condemn Hamas unequivocally. The October 7th attacks were barbaric. They were horrific. They were indiscriminate. And these were strong statements by Israel's Abraham Accords partners. Uh, we also seen that on the economic level, trade with UAE and Bahrain has stayed steady, at least through October, which is the latest month that we have data for. Um, with Morocco, it has gone down. Security cooperation um, remains steady as well. We recall that the Houthis, since 2015, launched more than a thousand attacks against the Emiratis and against the uh, and, and against Saudi Arabia, primarily against Saudi Arabia. So these countries know what the Houthi threat is and what the Iranian threat is very well. On the other hand, we have seen uh, a decline in the people-to-people -people activity in some of the public economic activity. And let's be frank, um, the media in the Arab world, not just out, certainly Al Jazeera, but not just Al Jazeera, really across the board has been quite negative um, for the most part um, during the course of the conflict. And that's affected public opinion. We're gonna have a lot of work to do during the war and, um, and going forward. In terms of how this impacted the war in Gaza, the countries of the Abraham Accords, one way that it has, in fact, I think played a positive role is that due to the trust and the connections that have been built between Israel and these countries, it has allowed these countries also to play a more active role in uh, delivering aid to the Palestinians in Gaza. So the Emiratis have set up a field hospital in Gaza, the Bahrainis have delivered aid as well. Um, and it's allowed for an ongoing dialogue between Israel and its Arab partners um, because these channels of communication are open. Very interesting. So let me ask you, I guess it goes both ways. There's how have the Abraham Accords uh, helped or harmed the war in Gaza? And then what has the war in Gaza done to the Abraham Accords and Israel's normalization uh, with Arab states? So the 
On the one hand, we have to deal with the negative public opinion um, created largely by the media. On the other hand, the rationale of the Abram Accords not only still exists, the desire both for um, economic cooperation, a future of innovation, a future based on, you know, in the UAE and Bahrain and Morocco as well, you have very strong cultures of tolerance, of multiculturalism, of uh, Jew in Morocco, of Jewish Muslim dialogue, and that still remains. But in a sense, it's even become even stronger because these grand visions, these grand projects happening in the Middle East, being led by Saudi Arabia, first and foremost, require regional stability, they require regional investment, and they require regional connectivity and integration. Imagine a land route connecting East and West via uh, the Gulf states, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, potentially also including the Palestinian uh, Authority as well. Um, so the the uh, rationale, the, the justification for increasing integration between Israel and Arab states has grown even stronger. Now, looking, to looking ahead, um, there's been quite a lot of talk of the UAE and Saudi Arabia being involved in the reconstruction of Gaza. Um, one element of that is the physical reconstruction, but another very important element is what you might call the cultural reconstruction, or what some people have called the uh, de, de uh, radicalization or denazification of Gaza. And people like to talk about Germany, Japan, but there are actually two examples that are much more recent and much closer regionally. In the UAE through the 90s, most of the teachers in the education system were either radical Palestinians or members of the Muslim Brotherhood. And in the 90s, the MRIs basically kicked all of those radical actors, often anti-Semitic actors, out of their education system and replaced it with a culture of tolerance and dialogue and, and, and mutual respect. And the Saudi Arabia right now is undergoing a very interesting process of reducing the influence of the, the radical religious establishment and building a new culture of nationalist pride of vision 2030 of regional leadership and taking those models. And it may take a year, it may take five years, it may take 20 years, but not just rebuilding Gaza in terms of physically rebuilding, but in terms of creating a culture of peace rather than a culture of terror, I think Israel's peace partners and regional partners could have a very important role to play there as well. So we've had a number of um, speakers in our program here who have postulated that one of the reasons for this war in Gaza was to derail normalization with Saudi Arabia. So I'll ask you, do you think that's true? And if it is true, that was a piece of the puzzle, has it done anything to, to, to stop a process with Saudi Arabia and Israel? I think it was a piece of the process of the puzzle. I think there are you no, know, Hamas has ideological reasons, religious reasons. It has, uh, it's being pushed by Iran. It was planning to attack for quite a while. This wasn't something decided upon in a short notice. But yes, certainly Iran and its axis in the region look at this process of the Abraham Accords, of the growing ties between Israel, Saudi Arabia, the Abraham Accords countries, and they are very worried. Uh, despite the Iranian, Saudi Arabia uh, uh, reconciliation, there's still very, very deep suspicion and competition between these countries. They still see themselves as, as enemies. Um, so yes, I do believe that was quite, uh, that was an important factor. Now, I think that going ahead, there are going to be challenges and there, and this, like I said, first and foremost, challenges related to public opinion. Um, the leadership of Saudi Arabia is cautious, likes to move ahead step by step. Um, but I do think, and, 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 and indeed, we're going to need all the partners and allies and diplomatic support and business support and, and um, you know, support from countries like India, which has a key interest in seeing this land bridge from European countries that have a key interest in seeing overland trade and energy cooperation, and innovation cooperation. There's going to need to be a major international effort, of course, by Israel as well, to put normalization, to put integration back on track, but I'm, I'm optimistic. Very interesting. You mentioned something um, I want to talk about for a second in terms of the day after in Gaza, potentially Saudi Arabia or the UAE being involved. Uh, what would be in it for them? You know, it seems like such a mess what's happening in Gaza and the potential plans thereafter. And many parts of the Arab world kind of closing their doors to Gaza. Why would Saudi Arabia or the UAE be interested in that? Partly because, as I mentioned before, they have a very strong interest in regional stability. 
and regional development. And it's going to be difficult for Saudi Arabia to attract massive private investment for its mega projects in uh, Neom, for example, which is not far from Israel, Egypt, Gaza, the Red Sea, if we don't have stability in the region. And as long as Hamas has any role or, or other extremists, other terrorists have a role in governing Gaza, that stability is going to, as long as the Houthis are attacking ships coming to the Red Sea, that kind of stability is going to be difficult to achieve. Secondly, I think it has to, it goes to the traditional support, not so much for the Palestinian leadership and the PA. I think that most of these countries understand, um, I'm certain these countries understand how corrupt and ineffective the PA is, but the traditional support for the Palestinian people, which is authentic. And therefore, I think that from that perspective and the desire both of Saudi Arabia, of the UAE to play a leadership role, that might also bring them um, to be willing to invest. Um, but again, they're not going to invest just for another war to break out in two years and for their investments to go down the drain. Only if Israel eliminates Hamas and the other terrorist organizations and we're able to slowly and create this process of a better de-radicalized future, then I think these countries would be willing to invest. And also, as the last point, in order to push Qatar out as well. Because recall, from 2017, 2021, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, and Egypt boycotted Qatar. Uh, you couldn't fly from Saudi Arabia to Qatar. Um, now, again, there's been a, the end of the boycott and some kind of reconciliation, but that competition still exists very much so. Fascinating. You mentioned Qatar, and we're going to get to Qatar. But before that, um, one of our viewers sent in a great question. And a big thank you to all of our viewers who send in questions either in the chat or email them to me before or after the briefing. If you could just give us an overview in general of what are the goals of the Abraham Accords? Are the purpose of the Abraham Accords for Israel to expand its business horizons? Or is there a strong element of building up an alliance, as the questioner asked, against Iran? I would say there are, and there are, there are many reasons, but I would say three key ones. First of all, on the economic or innovation level, the countries of the Abraham Accords are looking to diversify their economies, they're looking to increase innovation, they're looking to deal with the major challenges that they're facing, whether it's water security, food security, energy efficiency, these are major, major challenges that these countries are facing. These countries also want to be at the forefront of fields like AI, of fields like smart mobility. So therefore, the ties with Israel are very important, as are very, even perhaps even just as important, if not more so, the U.S. commitment to this process and U.S. investments that were or are going to be part of this process. Secondly, Iran is certainly a part of this. Like I said, Houthis, which are a clear Iranian proxy, have launched thousands of attacks against Saudi and Emirati oil and gas fields, airports. The Moroccans, their greatest security challenge is the Polisario Front in Western Sahara. The Polisario received training from Iran and Hezbollah via Algeria. Um, Saudi Arabia, Iranian tensions are still very strong. So the threat from Iran is a very important element of the Abraham Accords. And lastly, as I mentioned, certainly in the UAE and Bahrain, you have a strong culture of tolerance, of mutual respect. In Morocco, you have a strong heritage of Jewish-Muslim relations. And I think that also plays a tie, um, a part in the Abraham Accords and the desire of the leaders of these countries to strengthen that culture of multi-tolerance and dialogue and, um, and openness. In terms of the two-state solution, are there Arab countries that make their relationship with Israel a contingent on Israel adopting a two-state solution? I think the Arab countries would like to see a Palestinian state. At the same time, they know very well that, again, the PA is corrupt and ineffective. The Hamas, they know quite well that Hamas is a, is a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. So they are strongly supportive of the goal, but I think they understand that there's not much to work with. I think my personal analysis is that in the day after uh, Mahmoud Abbas, Abu Mazen, we're going to see further decentralization um, in Judea and Samaria in the West Bank, um, sort of localized power, centers of power um, at the expense of some sort of overall um, authority. So I think we'll continue to see not just rhetoric, but a, but a commitment on the part of the 
Arab leaders to this. But one of the underlying principles of the Abram Accords is that the road forward for regional progress and cooperation is not going to be stuck in Ramallah. If there's an opportunity to move forward, great. I think these countries are also going to pursue their security and economic goals. And they're going to the understanding that it's not a zero sum game, that it's not, you know, you're pro-Palestinian or you're pro-Israel, that Arab countries can continue to support the Palestinians, but also continue to develop their ties with Israel. I think that's going to grow deeper. Again, the war is going to, there's going to be a lot of work to do after the war. Um, but I do think that with the help of both governmental, but also private sector actors going forward, that we can get back onto the right path. All right, let's shift gears and talk a little bit about Qatar. You published an article in The Hill, which I'll share with everyone in the chat because it's a great piece to read um, about Qatar and the U.S. Let's start with Israel. Is Qatar helping Israel in this war or is Qatar just making things worse? Qatar's number one goal in the current war is to preserve Hamas. It's for Hamas to survive. On the one hand, they want to be uh, U.S. allies. They want Israel to enable them to be active in Gaza. On the other hand, they are committed to Hamas's survival. Now, Israel cannot ignore Qatar because of the role, the, the, the leverage that, or the ties that Qatar has with Hamas. Um, and therefore, we are talking to the Qataris. Um, ha happily, we're, happily, we're not talking to Qataris in Doha currently. We're now talking to them in Europe, which is, which is actually much better. Um, but I believe very strongly that both Israel and the United States and Europe as well need to change their policies towards Qatar. Qatar could be doing much more than it is to bring about the release of the hostages. And it's time for Israel, but even more so the United States, to say to Qatar, you have to make a choice. You are either a American and European ally or you're a state sponsor of terrorism, and you can't be both. Do you think that Qatar has the ability, if they wanted to, to just make Hamas do whatever they want? We have to remember that it's true that some of the Qatari money transferred, transferred from Qatar to Gaza um, was with Israeli coordination and approval in order to essentially prevent a humanitarian uh, collapse. Remember that the PA was trying to impose a economic blockade on Hamas and stop transferring money. And Israel accepted the Qatari offer to replace the PA money with Qatari uh, funds. On the other hand, if you recall on October 18th, the US Treasury designated a senior Hamas operative who lives and works in Qatar, who's been transferring tens of millions of dollars to Hamas, including to its military wing. And that's not something that happens without the Qatari authorities knowing about it. Um, Qatar has been a key, uh, key pla provided a key platform for Hamas via Al Jazeera, for example. Qatar could say to Hamas, either release the hostages, or we will expose and cut off your financial network. We will kick out your leaders. We will cease um, providing you with financial support, logistic support, communication support. I mean, has not done that. And it's played this game, which, you know, to, to work with the U.S. and to preserve. Qatar, you have to remember, is very, very sensitive towards its public image. That's why it's paying for universities in the U.S., why it's paying for sports teams, why it is involved in a EU scandal currently dubbed Qatargate because it was allegedly uh, bribing members of the EU in order to improve its public image. Um, so, yes, I believe that Qatar could be doing much more um, and is choosing not to. It's, again, playing this role. How do we save Hamas while preserving our image in the West? Now, all of the money that Qatar has pumped into Hamas, if Hamas is successfully destroyed, or when Hamas, I should say, is successfully destroyed by Israel, what is Qatar going to do with that money? Are they going to pump it into the PA? Are they going to pump it into the next government in no, Gaza? They'll, they'll, they'll give it to Harvard to make up for the uh, billion dollars that Jewish donors are still giving it. Giving it. No, but I, you know, there, there's, a, there's a crazy revelation um, by La Parkov um, in the Jewish Insider that one of the bodies that's advising the families of the hostages is Qatari funded. And that organization recommended to the hostage families not to criticize Qatar. 
Um, so we're only, I think, just barely scraping the surface of how deep Qatari influence is around the world. And I think that they will continue to use all these various levers related to public diplomacy, related to academia, related to real estate ownership, right? The, the Empire State Building lit up in Qatari colors because Qatar is a major owner of the Empire State Building Corporation or, or body. Um, so <laughs> there, will, there, will, there will be no uh, lack of what to do with its money. And look, again, if, if, if Qatar, I, I, I'm not opposed in principle to a Qatari role, meaning if Qatar ends its support for terror, ends its support for Hamas, expels Hamas's leaders, um, then I think Qatar could play a positive role in the future of Gaza or potentially in the future of the Palestinian Authority. But again, it has to make its choice. Either it is a Western ally or it is a sponsor of terror. I very much appreciate you entertaining all my questions. I have one more question before we close. We're almost out of time. Even though we started late, we still have to end on time. And I'll just let all of our viewers know tomorrow we have a great program in store. In addition to, of course, Brigadier General Amir Aviv providing an important war update, we're going to be joined by Colonel Richard Kemp. So it's uh, going to be a very important conversation and presentation tomorrow. Asher, thank you so much for all of this. Last question, which was really the thrust of that article that I shared in the chat right now. The U.S. and Qatar. The U.S. obviously um, has a, a major investment military-wise in Qatar, but yet at the same time, Qatar is not always acting in the U.S.'s best interests. What should or could be done there? Qatar, which you mean, Qatar is much more dependent on the U.S. and the U.S. is on Qatar. Qatar is threatened by Iran. It uh, shares its, its oil and gas facilities, or its gas facilities primarily with Iran. It needs the U.S. Now, the U.S., it's true, has uh, invested quite a bit in Qatar, but it also has military bases in the UAE. Saudi Arabia wants to increase its military cooperation with the US as part of this normalization agreement with Israel as well. The US could say to Qatar, look, we are going to reconsider our military, our economic, our um, academic cooperation with you. We are going to reconsider your status, which is very proud of as a major non-NATO US ally. Uh, we don't need you as much because we're out of Afghanistan as well. It's less critical for us. We're going to reconsider and reevaluate this relationship unless you show yourself to be a U.S. ally by stopping supporting a U.S. designated terror organization and helping release the hostages, including eight American citizens. And also, again, and that's the last thing I want to say is here, too, I think there is a role for um, civil society, for private organizations. I believe that um, people should be companies or should be refusing Qatari sponsorships, should not be participating in Qatari conferences. Um, I know that there are a number of legal groups looking to um, sue Qatar for its support for Hamas, victims of terror. Um, so there's quite a range of steps that could be taken to pressure Qatar to use every ounce of its leverage on Hamas to release the hostages. Asher, thanks so much for joining me, for sharing this with all of our viewers and supporters. This has been incredibly insightful. Asher Fredman of the um, Abraham Accords Peace Institute and Ms. Gav, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we look forward to catching up with you and hopefully after this war, hearing about the amazing developments of the Abraham Accords. Thank you to all of our viewers and all of our supporters, wishing everyone they should stay safe, stay strong, take care. Thank you very much. Take care.